Today's episode is part two of Dr. Ben Aiken's story. If you didn't hear part one, I suggest you listen to that first so you don't miss out on the impact Dr. Aiken and Lantern Health are making in North Carolina. Direct primary care is an innovative alternative path to insurance-driven health care. Typically, a patient pays their doctor a low monthly membership and, in return, builds a lasting relationship with their doctor and has their doctor available at their fingertips. Welcome to the My DPC Story podcast, where each week you will hear the ever so relatable stories shared by physicians who have chosen to practice medicine in their individual communities through the direct primary care model. I'm your host, Marielle Conception, family physician, DPC owner, and former fee-for-service doctor. I hope you enjoy today's episode and come away feeling inspired about the future of patient care, direct primary care. When we talk about the two clinics, one of the questions I have is how to t- how to set the team up for success because you're not going to be able to be there micromanaging, nor do you probably want to micromanage the people who are supposed to come on and buy into and portray the mission, vision, and values of your practice to the community. How do you set them up for success so that they are encouraged to be innovative? Because I know that you value that, as well as respecting what the core of Lantern Health is and continues to be. Yeah, it's a work in progress. I have not figured it out to be really blunt, but it feels like we hopefully are on the path to figuring it out. I really don't like to micromanage, nor do I like to be micromanaged. And so we really try to kind of, I think for those of us who think back to residency or medical school, you know, you may have heard of the concept of an adult learner, if you will. So you kind of enter this phase of learning in school where nobody's holding your hand. You've got to kind of do these things independently. And in essence, kind of we, it's like a little odd to say, but we kind of like the idea of all being adult workers. We give everybody on the team a degree of independence. Um, and have expectations that they're going to get their stuff done, um, but have that flexibility. And if this week it looks a little bit different in terms of them getting their stuff done than last week, and they've got to flex because they have kids or something else comes up, like that's okay, life happens. Um, But there's that kind of built-in trust. And so it's not perfect. Um, So I would say that in terms of the new the new location one, we tried to have folks spend some time with us at the current location just to get a feel kind of connect with the ethos and the culture. I created a team handbook, which is, I'd say, about a 20-ish page document, maybe 15 to 20 pages that really kind of walks through some of the basics in relation to what, how do we dress and how do we do this and what, how does PTO work and those types of things, but also speaks some to, and really tries to orient people around our culture and our mission, vision, values, and really kind of emphasize that it's not just kind of like, like we talk about it, have people read it and then really to try to connect and answer questions and really get that sense of connection in to what we're doing so that that culture spreads. This, the clinic is about 20 to 25 minutes away from where our, our current clinic is. So I have a presence. I do go there on a weekly basis. I was there more out of the st- at the start than I am now, but we really try to make it feel collaborative, but also allow them to have some independence um, so that's how we've approached it. It feels very palatable and doable, even if let's say we had a third location kind of in our immediate community. Um, I think the idea, and we've been grappling with this, we haven't kind of decided what to do, but one of our employer groups has is headquartered in Winston-Salem, which is a community about two hours away from us um, that has very little DPC presence compared to what we have here. And this employer group's headquartered there, but they've got 30 employees in Asheville. They've been coming to us for two years. They've been asking for two years, hey, would you be willing to open a location here? I can't afford it yet, and but have had interest, but I don't have a presence there. And so as I think about trying to replicate something where it's that far away, it becomes more complicated. I, I like a healthy challenge. And so if an opportunity strikes, I think it would be a fun thing to try to, to do. But at the same time, I think that I don't know what one thing we talk about is, yes, we have brand identity and at least some kind of the built-in offerings and the structure and kind of who's who's staffing and that sort of thing is really consistent. At least our vision was is that it will be consistent across practices. Um, but we also want each practice to feel hyper-local. Um, and so we call it the cheers effect, um, which is if you walk in, everybody knows your name. 
that may date some or date me in comparison to some of the listeners, if you know what I'm talking about as relates to the sitcom. But that idea that people feel really connected to their lantern location, it's their local coffee shop. And so if we replicate, and I, I can't predict the future, but let's say if we get bigger and bigger at some point, like in a more regional presence where, you know, hey, I may not be present at all over the course of months somewhere, it becomes, it feels like it becomes harder to do. But at the same time, if if each practice is really connected and interwoven with their local locality, I think it at least is possible. I'm sitting here in the Diane Chambers camp, like singing the the theme song now as we're talking. So oh. like I'm with you right and right with you. And I know exactly what you're talking about. Norm. So yeah, if you don't know what we're talking about, Google it, man. It's it's worth it. So exactly. let me ask you now. <laughs> let me ask you now about this idea of two clinics. And now you're talking about three. When when people are like, whoa, he has two clinics. One of the questions that I want to ask you for those people specifically is how did you come to the decision of this is the right time to open a second location? It's something I've been thinking about since we started. Being fully transparent, part of the vision that was compelling to me to do this as part of a health system originally was that we were going to pilot this. And then if it worked, try to scale it to the whole health system to be the basically the new model of primary care for the health system. And so as a system level thinker and somebody who's drawn to that side of things, it was like, bing, 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 this sounds really interesting because yes, near term, I'm not going to provide an off-ramp for other docs. So man, if we pull this off, then holy cow, we could kind of bail out like all these other docs that really don't want to do fee-for-service anymore. Of course, it didn't come to happen. It didn't come to fruition, but some of that vision and and kind of dream is still there for me. Um, So it had been something that we've been thinking about. We were nearing the point of, of... kind of the horizon of being full. We, at our current location, our downtown location, we were already at capacity from a physician perspective, but the last physician, last two position panels were still not quite full. And so I just kind of started to think about it in a potential timeline, had a couple kind of inbound interests from some other docs and some employers that were on that part of town who were kind of asking for things. The real stimulus for us to do it is a space became available. So I had kind of planted a seed with a realtor that I trust to say, hey, can you just keep an eye on clinic opportunities? And an OBGYN was retiring and had a space that she had built out less than five years ago that was in essence turnkey. And I was alerted to that space before it hit the market and felt and it, it felt risky, but right. So, so that was in part the stimulus and I had in essence kind of found out about it and we were open less than six months later. And so that kind of fast tracked driving, hiring and securing the debt and the other things to pull it all off. But that was the driver and there was risk. I mean, I I might not have hired somebody, but I signed on this lease before I had hired the team and being an entrepreneur, you get comfortable with some degree of risk. And it felt like at that phase that that was a risk we're taking and we were able to pull off the hires and get folks in there and launch. But that was the, that was the thing that basically pushed me over the edge. Awesome. So now I want to shift to talking about employers because your practice, I I think you said this in September of last year, that about 55% of your practice is coming through via employer sponsored, employer sponsored plans. So when we think of the employer space, some people think about, okay, the mom and pop shop, they, I talked to them, went to their business, talked to them, and they brought their employees. But also people are bringing employers into the DPC space via a broker who used to be a a BUCA broker. So for the people who aren't necessarily familiar with this employer space or are interested in it, interested in learning more about the employer space and how to bring employers and their employees onto their DPC, can you talk to us about how you've created how you've created a value proposition for those employers, whether they be small or larger, to attract people to your DPC? Yeah, I can certainly try. I think there are differing perspectives on kind of where employer-sponsored care fits alongside of DPC. And I think there's merit in everybody's side. Our leaning towards starting to get into it was based on the reality that over 50% of Americans get their health care through employers. And even if you've there's various aspects at a high level that uh, of, of our system that employers are required to do this. It's just sort of like actually crazy. 
but it is the reality in our country right now. And I think the likelihood that it changes and that meaningfully in the near term is very low. And so we felt like we wanted to engage in it, one, because just that size of uh, that many people getting their benefits through employers. And the second is, is that kind of the deeper you dive in terms of kind of the non-DPC stuff. So let's say a DPC, let's just for easy math, we do 80% of, we cover 80% of what somebody needs, but that other 20% can be very costly and it can be really complex. It can be misguided and all the different things. But the folks that seem to be pushing the envelope the most in that space are really forward-thinking employers. And so with that framework, we kind of, from the beginning said, hey, you know what, we want to try and engage employers and try to learn through that experience. So it has been very much a learning process. We serve, I think our smallest employer group is two. We have no minimums and we have a, I think a two person watchmaking shop and our largest employer has over 500 employees and, and there's everything in between. So we've kind of seen the full gamut from folks that just provide direct primary care alone in a small business. They've never provided benefits before or generally because they're not required to or they can't afford it and they want to do something. Um, and then DPC feels like something that is really high value to folks that are looking at two to three fully built out plans with complicated stop loss coverage and PBM and networks and all the rest who say, hey, you know what, we want to pair this plan or all of our plans with direct primary care in a more sophisticated way. Um, and then folks that are in between um, who are leveraging health shares or level funded plans or different things. And so I, I would say that I have learned more about employer sponsored care and health insurance than I would have ever imagined. And as someone who, I don't know, I think it's kind of hard to go to med school if you're not a nerd in some regard. So as someone who is comfortable with the reality of being a nerd, I have enjoyed that learning. Um, but it also is one of these things that the deeper you get, the deeper you get. And it feels like every there, there, where there's a lot of excitement from my perspective is you turn over these new rocks. Let's take the PBM world, for example. So PBM stands for pharmacy benefit manager. So this is the pharmacy component of your insurance plan. Um, it is a total racket um, underneath the hood, like the amount of kickbacks and rebates and all these things and people just extracting money, like the value extractors live in the PBM world. And so it's fun. We're being disruptive in the primary care space, hopefully in a positive way. And, and then you start looking in these other things and you're like, oh my gosh, like this is really endemic across all the different silos in healthcare. And so one, learning up on that stuff and at least being able to understand the language that employers are using or brokers are using when they're talking about these things has been really empowering and helpful for us to be able to convey our story. So that's one in terms of like, how have we been able to convey this value to just be authentic? Like you don't have to be overly salesy, just come across as a doctor who really cares and wants to take care of people. At the end of the day, business owners that like, that's what they want. They want a good experience for their team. And if they develop a trusting relationship with you and your team, um, I think that's really, really compelling. Um, there are other nuances that, that have emerged. I think we've had employers reach out to us directly, and that certainly is the cleanest but we also partner with brokers and advisors and consultants kind of all bucketed into the same place um, who really bring an immense amount of value and see the value in us. And we're part of their bigger offering. And that's been really helpful. I would say that that still is the minority of brokers, advisors, and consultants. And so just be cautious and in having conversations with brokers, certainly share what you're about, but there. There are a fair number of brokers that we've experienced who kind of make you feel as this is the best thing since sliced bread. And unfortunately, on the backside, because there's no incentives for them, there's no big commissions, or, or in some ways, maybe we kind of threaten the commissions from the, the BUCAs, the Blue Cross, the United Cigna, and the Humanas of the world, um, who will kind of behind closed doors really kind of not, not enable us at all, actually make it notably worse. We've had that happen on a number of occasions. I'm not trying to throw brokers uh, and folks under the table. I think anybody that is in their shoes, how they are incentivized is really going to be how they're driving decisions. And their incentives aren't to bring in DPC and most traditional models. And just be aware of that. That's okay. Um, we're working to try to change that. And I think for brokers that are open to a different path, and certainly for those that are really driving aggressively towards the path that we're on, we're, we're providing them this 
off ramp from the status quo that they can actually feel better, I think, about themselves and sleep better at night uh, by partnering with direct primary care and actually trying to decrease cost overall for these employers. And so that has taken time. Like we have, we have tested, we've had, we've got some really healthy relationships. And I think now over four years, we've developed a good like handful of advisors and brokers who we trust and they trust. Like they trust us, we trust them and it's, and it's healthy. We have been really intentional not to be tied to one. And so we kind of like to say that we're broker agnostic, but I would say we're mainly uh, broker agnostic oriented towards brokers that see the value and really drive the value of primary direct primary care and the plans that they offer. And yeah, I guess I'll leave it at that. I mean, I think in ter- even if you're using a broker, I do, I would encourage you in all instances to try to have a direct interface with the business decision maker, if you can, not to bypass or to kind of go around the broker. I think there are ways in which the broker can be the one that is orchestrating the deal. Some people will disagree with the other and that's totally fine. But I think having a direct relationship uh, with an employer positions us well in the case that that broker relationship or partnership doesn't go well and they decide that they want to keep the direct primary care component, but not the plan component. That's just a positioning that can be helpful in terms of how we've learned. And again, talk to people in your community, because if you're in North Carolina, Ben's going to be able to to say, these are the people who really get DPC. And yes, there are brokers out there who were previously selling BUCA plans that just like us left leaving fee for service and leaving the guaranteed salary and the seven year mortgage payment and all the stuff. It's there are people who believe in primary care and solidifying the place of primary care in our nation going forward to be to create better health care for everybody. So that is definitely something that hap- that is happening. And also looking at this data with about half of DPCs working with employers, one of the things that I hear very frequently is this concern about how do I work with someone and build a value proposition that's attractive to the employer, but also that's going to respect the autonomy and innovation of the DPC? So when I say that specifically, like there was a, a story where a broker was saying, oh, yeah, we'll totally we would love to bring your DPC into the fold of the other Buka plans that we're selling. This person had not stopped selling Buka plans, but we need you to be able to be available 24-7, 365. And so that's what I speak to when there's some hesitancy out there about how do I maintain my autonomy and what I want this practice to be, but I still want to work with employers. Yeah, there are different approaches that people take. I'll share a little bit about what we've done and kind of what we learned through the process and we're still learning. So it's a, it's a in, in motion. And working with employers for us generally is, is more work. And I would say that it's more work in a couple of ways. So one, getting engagement from the employees, actually getting them in for their initial appointment is harder. And but is equally important. If you're not engaged in our practice, we want people that are engaged. That's our, our premise. That's what we're here for. And if you don't engage, then it's really hard for us to help you. So we want people to be engaged. If you signed up yourself and you're paying the monthly fee, you're going to engage pretty darn quick. And if somebody's paying the fee on your behalf and that person is your employer, you may not. So uh, that's something that we have to work harder at. The second is turnover is higher in certain industries, especially for us. So let's take the restaurant industry. There's a fair bit of turnover. And from my understanding, there's high turnover in the restaurant industry nationwide. And so in taking care of what we feel strongly about wanting to care for that community, it's historically an underserved community in Asheville and there is more turnover. So we develop these deep relationships and more people than not do not stay on when they change jobs or leave that restaurant. And so the turnover is higher. And then the third is you're managing two relationships, right? You're managing the relationship with the patient and you're managing the relationship with the employer. So as it relates to, I I think that latter point, which is the relationship with the employer, which is where I spend a lot of time thinking on is making sure that there is alignment there. So two things to note. So one is when you're having conversations with employers, it's not atypical or for brokers, like it's not atypical for them to have expectations about what they want in the relationship with you. And a lot of that is based on what they've heard or previous experiences that they've had. And the first thing that I always think through is, is this necessary? So an example would be, hey, listen, like we really want to see all of the data, all of the A1Cs for anybody on our team that has diabetes. And so where I've learned to do more, like 
in terms of just the conversation is really heading that off at the pass, right? So not we have over 60 employer groups that we partner with now, and none of them require us to give them A1C data. And so it's really actually having a conversation on the front end to say, hey, let's break this down a little bit. What, are you, what do you think you're asking for here? And kind of what is it that you're driving towards? You want to, maybe it's you want to make sure that people that have diabetes that are on your team are actually getting care. They're going in, they're getting engaged. Like you're actually not really going to be interpreting what the A1C number is, not to mention that A1Cs don't correlate with mortality, blah, blah, blah. Like you just kind of go through as deep as you want, but really kind of talking them back from saying, hey, listen, rather than spend the money to build some kind of infrastructure for that type of data to flow, let's really focus on what we're here to do, which is to take really good care of your folks. And here, here's why the, the incentive model works. So that's one is this kind of, if they bring up something and it kind of rubs you the wrong way, you're not going to necessarily torpedo the oper- opportunity by just gently pushing back and suggesting an alternative. So that's one. And then the second is trying to think through, and and maybe I would say that we feel like we need to convey our value. All of the tools historically to convey value in primary care are built on claims. We do not generate claims. We have no interest in generating $0 claims, which is what a lot of the big companies do in order. And the only reason they do that is so that they can use these health analytics engines to extract data from the claims. So We are, in essence, kind of biding our time for the right technology partner to facilitate getting some basic data out that we can share with employers. Um, And our premise is that we lead that and that the employers don't lead that. And so that's how we've approached it. I don't have none of my employer, none of our employer groups that we partner with require this. But what we try to do for our employers is a couple of fold. So one is if an employer employee has not in, engaged in care, come in for an initial appointment within 90 days, we let that employer know and that employer can either nudge the employee to like actually do it or they would drop the coverage. So then in essence, the employer is, avoids having to pay for somebody that's not utilizing our services. Um, our experience has been is that anybody, if we can just get them in for that first appointment, then the light bulb goes off and they're like, oh, wow, this is different. Like we want this and I'm comfortable with this. So we do that. Employers don't make us do that. It's not in our contract, but we try to orient around. We feel like if we're doing our job well, we're working hard to engage people and get them in. The other is we convey patient satisfaction. So we measure it through what's called a net promoter score. And we feel like that is a good gauge back to us, probably the best gauge of any metric that's out there to tell us that we're doing a good job. And we share that with our employers, certain target employers, because we feel like it helps to convey the value that we're bringing them. As an example, we are working towards better utilization data, and that would be number and type of appointment. I am very hesitant to try to create something in which basically we're trying to get and mark up the number and type of appointments just because it's some silly metric. But if there's a passive way that we can just extract the data and look at it periodically, and then if an employer asks, we can, and we've done this a couple of times manually, and on average, we're touching employees usually 10 to 14 times a year in some capacity, text, in-person, phone, video, all the things. And that's really, really compelling. They're like, holy cow, wow, like people are using what you're offering. And so in that, in that capacity, like in that capacity, we feel like that the data is, if we can stay upstream of that and really push technology partners towards getting that right that it will actually enable us to kind of, if you will, dictate that conversation. Though there certainly is, there's a lot of healthy debate around data and analytics, and like what's actually robust and legit, but that's how we're approaching it. So some data, but we try to be very focused in terms of what we're doing. Uh, but we've also been very strategic to make sure that we're not held to any of those things, that it's in, in essence kind of icing on the cake that helps us to facilitate longer standing healthy relationships. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And it's super helpful. And it also leads me into what I wanted to talk about next is our time in DC. We were sitting at the table, you and I as independent DPC doctors with, I think there were maybe 10 of us who were independent DPC doctors, along with the lobbyist from Amazon, along with the lobbyist from Boeing and other representatives in the DPC movement from different organizations. But that was that was one thing that it, it harkens to Dr. Garrison Bliss's whole statement on physicians need to be leading this movement because if we don't the the data is going to be skewed and the the ways that data is going to be skewed 
and it definitely sets us up for sets us up for setting for for building another fee for service type system. So when it comes to what we were in DC for, one of the things that was amazing that came out of it after our our lobbying in DPC, our lobbying efforts in DPC was that of the two bills that we were lobbying for, one of them was the Medicaid Improvement Act. That bill passed the House floor unanimously. It was bipartisan supported by Dr. Kim Schreier, who's a pediatrician, and then uh, um, Dan Crenshaw, who is a Republican in the House. But I want to I want to ask you if you can just give a summary of what is the Medicaid Improvement Act, that it is not, we're going to start taking Medicaid and Medi-Cal tomorrow, and how was your presence received in D.C.? Okay. How I think about the Medicaid Improvement Act, and I'm not a policy guru, I'm the son of an attorney, but I am very much not an attorney. Entities at the state level, so Medicaid is determined on a state-by-state basis, it gives med- entities at a state level who want to be forward-thinking and, in essence, open up direct primary care as a place for Medicaid recipients to get their primary care, to have the flexibility to do that and not be afoul of any federal kind of overlying legislation. So that's how I think about it. So if in North Carolina, they decided that, hey, they want Medicaid recipients who are having trouble accessing primary care because the supply is not there for Medicaid recipients, especially where in essence, they can go to a direct primary care provider and have compensation to pay for that direct primary care provider, that they could do that. They could pilot that and offer it. So from my perspective, I think it's a it's it doesn't box any state in in any capacity. It actually unblocks states from being creative. And so in the direct primary care space, part of why I'm so excited about this specifically is you're starting to see in certain states where forward-thinking direct primary care practices or groups of practices who come together like available to like state employees or are available to school school entities like in a certain region. So these kind of state funded entities who have said, wow, like we see the benefit, we want this for people that are on our team. And I think that we'll see forward thinking states, especially as direct primary care grows and hopefully has some influence and advocacy that certain forward thinking states may say, hey, listen, like we've got a massive primary care problem. There's this cool movement happening that we wanna be able to tap into. And golly, the folks that cost the most to the state, these folks that are really sick, probably actually stand to benefit the most from something like this. Can we do it in a way where it's a win-win, where the doctors win and maintain their independence and we don't get in all the riffraff? That being said, I I think that's where it's going to be really interesting in terms of that state-level conversation. And I think physicians absolutely have to be at the table. Actually, I'll say direct primary care physicians absolutely have to be at the table if any program in any state is going to be structured in a way that maintains the incentive alignment. And so... Part of my bullish passion about trying to have as many DPC docs as possible, particularly independent DPC docs who understand that, is that that's more opportunity for us to have physicians at the table making these decisions so that we avoid incentive misalignment, which if I was going to use two words to describe fee-for-service medicine, that is it. And so anyway, there's absolutely a risk that if people that aren't practicing primary care on the front lines or concocting some scheme for Medicaid to pay for direct primary care, and there's not a DPC physician kind of there shaping that, that will lead down in some ways the exact same path that we've been on. At one point before I transitioned into DPC, I think North Carolina Medicaid was measuring 130 metrics for all the primary care providers delivering care. And without looking at that list, like that is just beyond excessive and burdensome. And so if North Carolina Medicaid said, hey, great, like Ben, we'll pay you for any Medicaid recipient that wants to come see you, but you got to give us 130, I'll say, see you later, talk another time. So that's where like us being at the table is really really important. So what did I learn from DC? The legislatures at the federal level, like one, I did not have to explain DPC most of the time. That was shocking. Five years ago, I would have had to explain it every time. So the word around, the buzz around DPC is growing and legislators are aware of it. The support on both sides of the aisle was striking. So actually what was really refreshing is that none of the conversations revolved around your political affiliation. It revolved around how do we get primary care to our constituents and direct primary care was something that people were excited by and really willing to drive towards. 
Um, all legislatures, I think they are thinking about the, the populations that cost the state and or the feds a lot of money, and the Medicaid population is that. And so uh, their drive towards this idea of, hey, we've heard all these great things about direct primary care, and we have to deal, like basically navigate and deal with this really, really expensive subset of the population that needs a ton of support. Like, how can we do this better? And those things are coming together in a way that uh, I think is pretty exciting. But like we as a collective DPC community, I think we have to engage so that we're at the table when those decisions are getting made. It was it was awesome. I, I had a very similar experience that it wasn't about what what political direction do you swing? It was about, wait, you're delivering this to people with Medi-Cal? How, how is that possible? And the, 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 the stories that we all have about for those of us in most states who can take Medi-Cal or Medicaid patients, it's it's unbelievable that people are just getting this care and just looking at how much is spent per Medicaid beneficiary and how restrictive their healthcare options are. Absolutely, you're going to save money. I mean, that that's exactly I think why this bipartisan supported bill passed unanimously. Because again, I encourage you to read the bill. It is going to be linked to Dr. Aiken's blog. But it basically is all about awareness. And that's exactly what we're getting at when we talked about in the in the beginning of your interview. Being aware of this model is a huge portion to help us grow. And this this Medicare and Medicaid Improvement Act talks about no later than one year of the enactment of this act, the Secretary of Health and Human Services shall convene at least one virtual open door meeting to seek input from stakeholders. So this is where, just like we've seen with the non-competes and we've seen with consolidation with Health and Human Services, Department of Justice, and the Federal Trade Commission earlier this year, this is where we can actually make change. And the language in this Medicaid Improvement Act says nothing about you need to change your practice and go back into fee for service. It does not say that. But again, I agree with you that this is it expands the opportunities for direct primary care to be delivered to more Americans. And I loved hearing when we were meeting with one of the staffers, Dr. Garrison Bliss said, I was 47 when I started thinking about direct primary care. And I'm 74 sitting here talking to you about this. But when you talk to Dr. Bliss, he is very passionate about quashing that myth that if we start talking the word Medicaid, the word Medi-Cal, he and Dr. Erica Bliss and all the people at Q-Lions took care of, I believe it was 30,000 people, and they didn't have to code. I, I asked him that. I was like, so many people are worried, though, that if we even mention the word Medicaid, if we get involved at the state level, that we're going to be we're going to be seen and DPC is going to change back to fee for service. He started laughing. And I was like, oh, I'm so reassured that you coming from his perspective at Q-Lions that he was like, that is so preposterous. But that belief that what made him laugh is because he is present at the table to speak to what we are doing in DPC. So this is just an open invitation to anyone and everyone who is passionate about this movement. Again, like Dr. Aiken and I are going to be in DC in September to be speaking to staffers, to lobbyists, to everybody about what we are doing as direct primary care physicians. Not, hey, like we're here with this political swing or whatever. Literally, that's all we're there for is to tell our stories as to how we are delivering excellent care in our communities. So do consider joining if you are interested, because I know a lot of people didn't even have any idea that we were in DC sharing our stories. Go to dpcare.org and hit the contact button and send your information that you want to be contacted about going in September just to share your story. So with that, and us talking about system level change, talking about working with employers, maintaining the crafted quality of care so that you are always paying attention to that individual at your practice. I want to ask about when people are at the table talking about their stories, how do people plant seeds positively so that other people are thinking about how DPC brings an option so that we're not recreating the current fee-for-service going forward? Yeah, a great question. And I, I don't know that I have an answer totally figured out. This is becoming a theme on this conversation. You ask good, hard questions. Here are my initial thoughts. I start with stories. So especially in the legislatures or in the community, obviously in a HIPAA compliant way, but share stories. Like people relate to stories. So 
really entrepreneurs who are really, really successful raising money, they have ideas, but they're really good storytellers. And so the idea is direct primary care and we're all by our like believers in it. But if you can, in essence, whether it is actually talking to somebody interested in joining our practice, talking to an employer, talking to a business, business owner or to a legislature, in my experience, the folks that connect with you at that gut level because of a story are going to remember things more than if you're just pitching kind of the nuts and bolts of DPC. So I think that needs to like that has from my perspective has to be a component because it's that stickiness factor that you can get. And then I think through stories, we're able to convey kind of some important tenets of direct primary care. So one is incentive alignment. You've heard me say it before, and I usually harp on that when I'm talking to folks that we're incentivized to keep people healthy in the first place based on the way the payment model works. Um, and that resonates and resonates quickly because if we're going to get this kind of crazy increase of healthcare spending under control, we have to get incentive realignment and primary care away from sick care and towards prevention in a better capacity. So that's one. I think relationship driven care and kind of really giving us the ability to do 80% of the work and then quarterback the rest is something that makes sense to a lot of folks. So I also speak to that when I'm talking to legislatures, because again, generally what they're thinking about, they're not really thinking about, hey, I only spent 7% of overall healthcare spend on primary care, but they're thinking about generally as, hey, 20% of the population costs us 80% of our spend. They're sick as stink. They're going to all these places. They're getting all these things. And we have to rein that in. And so thinking about how we fit into that picture and kind of being able to pivot like on the spot, some people kind of get where primary care fits, but other people don't. And so in essence, it's kind of subtly or not so subtly saying, hey, just as a reminder, like you don't have to look far, but primary care is the foundation of this healthcare system. It has to be. And you don't even need to ask me why, because it just has to be like every high functioning system is built, built on primary care. We are doing primary care differently. And here's how that is different. The incentives are aligned and here's why that matters. We're going to drive downstream um, costs to be much, much lower and everybody gets a better experience in the making. So those are the things that I harp on, whether they're totally effective. I don't know, but that's what I lean on so far. So with that, thank you so much, Dr. Aiken, for joining us today. Thank you. It was such a privilege, Ariel. Just really enjoyed it. Thank you for joining us for another episode of My DPC Story, highlighting the physician experience in the world of direct primary care. I hope you found today's conversation insightful and inspiring. If you want to dive deeper into the direct primary care movement, consider joining our My DPC Story Patreon community. Here, you'll have access to exclusive content, including more interview topics and much more. Don't forget to subscribe to My DPC Story on your podcast feed and follow us on social media as well. If you're able, I'd greatly appreciate if you could leave us a review. It helps others to find the podcast. Until next time, stay informed, stay healthy, and keep advocating for DPC. Read more about DPC News on the daily at dpcnews.com. Until next week, this is Marielle Conception.